So, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Jing Yi uh, from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and uh, my professor is Dr. Chris Yuan. Okay, uh, since we don't have many people here, then I will just start. <laughs> okay, um, I will present my research topic entitled Life Cycle Assessment of Provascite Solar Cell for its uh, Design and Manufacturing. So, before going into the details about life cycle assessment of provascite solar cell, I'm going to talk a little bit about provascite. So what is provascite? Provascite is a, a, ma a mineral material uh, which is shown on the left-hand picture uh, found in Russia, and its structure is ABX3. Okay, and why is, uh, why is this material so popular these days? The provascite material is applied in the solar cell, and uh, uh, it has a relatively low cost compared with silicon solar cell, and also it has high conversional efficiency. If you look at the right-hand picture, you can see uh, from 2009 uh, to 2015, the conversional efficiency uh, increases uh, dramatically from about one percentage to 20 percentage. Okay, um, though we have a lot of advantages of this kind of solar cell, we still have great concern about the toxicity potential of this solar cell and also the short lifetime. Um, for the great concern about the toxicity potential is because uh, the commonly used provascite material uh, in the solar cell is uh, CH3NH3PBI3. So there is lead usage in the provascite. So uh, a lot of people concern about the toxicity potential of this kind of provascite solar cell. And also, uh, according to current research, we found out that uh, more than 1,000 hours uh, lifetime uh, can be achieved by this provascite solar cell. But it is still relatively uh, low compared with the silicon solar cell, which uh, lifetime is about 30 years. OK. so. Um, we are going to talk about the life cycle assessment of this uh, provascite solar cell. Of course, we have four parts uh, as the traditional LCA. For goal and scope definition, um, for provascite solar cell, is uh, usually uh, divided into two basic forms. One is liquid state, and the other one is solid state. Okay. Um, we already did some research on the liquid state provascite solar cell, and we defined our boundary from crindle to gate, which is system manufacturing. Okay, um, that's because uh, at that time, there, uh, the end of life data is um, not abandoned, so we just decide to confine our boundary from grindle to gate. And the other form is solid state provascite solar cell. So we decided to have two different boundaries. One is from grindle to gate, and the other one is from grindle to grave. Uh, for the uh, boundary from grindle to gate, our purpose is to compare this LCA with the um, liquid state provascite solar cell. And uh, for the grindle to grave LCA, we just want to have a complete uh, LCA for the provascite dye solar cell. What is the functional unit of uh, our system? We defined our functional unit as one square centimeter, and it is interchangeable with uh, one kilowatt hour. We also uh, how assumptions, we also made some assumptions of the usage phase and uh, end of life. We assume there is a probability of a failure uh, in the usage phase for 1 over 300. And uh, we also uh, assume there is more lead O10 emissions uh, in the end of life. Okay, so life cycle inventory. Life cycle inventory, we did a lot of data mining in this phase. For the solid state provascite solar cell, we have six different layers. So it looks like this. 
And for the liquid state proboscis solar cell, we also have six layers. And this picture shows, shows us uh, what does the titanium dioxide nanotube looks like. For the upper three pictures, they are the uh, titanium dioxide nanotube, which are not dyed with the proboscite. And for the lower level three pictures, they are the dyed uh, titanium dioxide uh, nanotubes. So you can see the black dots uh, in the lower level, they are the proboscite dye deposited on the uh, TNT films. So after the life cycle inventory, uh, we input all of our inventory data into the Garby 6.1. That's the software we use for the life cycle assessment. And this is the result for the solid state proboscide solar cell. For the left hand side, you can see the result for the process based LCA. And for the right hand side, you can see the component based LCA result. Um, and uh, we will talk about the analysis for each uh, picture. So for the left hand side, you can see the raw material extraction, uh, organic solvent recycling, and the component manufacturing make the major contribution to the environmental impact uh, to, uh, for each environmental category. So what's the reason behind it? Uh, for Example, for the first one, raw material extraction, uh, the major contribution is from the gold mining. Okay, so you can also see the similar result from the right-hand side. Uh, for the uh, four different environmental categories, you can see it has large environmental impact uh, to uh, EP, HTP, uh, ODP and ADP. Uh, the reason behind it is because uh, gold mining uh, will emit a large amount of lead, uh, mercury, and arsenic into the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, when there is a precipitation, the mercury will find its way, go into the water body. So if it's intaken by the fish and then uh, ingested by the human body, the mercury will attack the human organs and also uh, attack the central nervous system. So that's the reason why, it's, uh, why the raw material extraction has a large contribution to these four categories. And for the organic solvent recycling, uh, here we have a scenario uh, assumed that there is 86% of organic is from the recycled, so, uh, recycled organic solvent. And a uh, large amount of organic solvents are used uh, in prepare, uh, prepare, preparing the FTO glass and the proboscite dye layer. Um, and for the component manufacturing, the main contribution is from the electricity usage in this uh, layer. And if, uh, if you can look at the right-hand side picture, we see the gold layer, FTO glass layer, and the proboscide dye layer have uh, the major contribution to the environmental impact. Um, we already talked about the uh, reason why gold layer has a large impact in the environment. Uh, how about the uh, FTO layer and the proboscide layer? Uh, mainly the reason is because the uh, organic solvent used to clean and uh, dissolve uh, the chemicals is a very surprising result because initially we thought it's because of the lead and the tin used in the proboscide layer which has a large environmental impact. And uh, the LC result turns out is not because of the lead, uh, it's because of the uh, organic solvents uh, used in the proboscide uh, layer. Mm, what is the reason behind it? Because we only use very small amount of uh, proboscide dye in the procedure to uh, fabricate the solar cell, but uh, we use a lot of organic solvents to clean and to dissolve the other chemicals. So that's the uh, rationale behind it. And also we have this result. The, um, Preparation of the proboscide dye only takes uh, about 0.5% of human toxicity potential uh, in the system manufacturing. 
Okay, so after uh, solid state uh, proboscis solar cell, uh, we talked about we want to compare these two systems. Uh, this is the research we did last year. So this is a liquid state proboscis solar cell. It has different components from the solid state proboscis solar cell. Uh, we can see uh, from the uh, component based um, uh, LCA. The proboscis dye has the uh, largest environmental impacts in uh, most of the environmental categories. And also TNT-based uh, anode also has a um, certain contribution to each category. Uh, similar to the solid-state proboscis solar cell, it's not because of the um, toxic metals used in the uh, preparation process. Rather than the uh, uh, organic solvent usage here. Okay, so after the life cycle assessment, we did some sensitivity and uncertainty analysis. If you still remember, I talked about the functional unit in the very beginning. Uh, we defined our functional unit as one square centimeter, and uh, we talked about the one square centimeter is interchangeable with one kilowatt hour. So some of you may be uh, wondering uh, why you use um, the one unit area instead of um, the electricity uh, generated for your functional unit, things the solar cell generate electricity. Uh, here, I want to present uh, uh, the sensitivity analysis because uh, the electricity generated from the solar cell is highly dependent on the insulation, lifespan, and the conversional efficiency. And these three factors are uncontrollable, actually. So we define our functional unit as a controllable unit, uh, functional unit. And then we use these three factors as our sensitivity analysis, in our sensitivity analysis here. So uh, based on this equation, you can see uh, the electricity generated is uh, linearly related with the insulation. Uh, conversional efficiency and the lifespan, and also the environmental impact is also linearly related with these three uh, parameters. Okay, so how about uncertainty analysis? We did an uncertainty analysis of the system manufacturing of solid state proboscis solar cell using Monte Carlo analysis. And uh, this is an example of the global warming potential uh, and certainty analysis. We got the average value of uh, the uh, green uh, greenhouse gas emission as 44.4 gram. And uh, the standard deviation uh, with positive and negative 10% variance of the material and the energy um, uh, input, we got a standard deviation as a uh, 5.36 percentage. So we think our uh, final result is reliable in this um, range. Okay. Uh, in, the, uh, in the last, so we are going to compare our uh, proboscis solar cell with other uh, solar cells. So we did two different systems. One is solid state proboscis and the other one is liquid state proboscis. If you see this table, you can see um, the proboscis solar cell uh, have, have comparable um, manufacturing energy with the first uh, generation and the second generation solar cells. And uh, also, um, they have a broader range for the uh, greenhouse gas emission. The reason behind it is because um, the lifespan for proboscis solar cell, we assume it can be one year, five year, 10 year, and uh, 30 years. Uh, because um, right now, uh, our lifespan is pretty short, but we think it may have the chance to increase in the following years. Okay, uh, we are going to conclude uh, our uh, research. So the first one is 
We think the solid state provascite solar cell will have a bright future if the lifespan and the conventional efficiency keep uh, increasing. And uh, uh, the other major uh, conclusion from our research is um, provascite dye uh, is not a major factor that affect the environment. Um, this is because um, in the um, process to prepare a probiotic dye, uh, the major contribution is from the uh, organic solvent usage rather than the probiotic dye preparation. So we think we should put more comfort uh, to uh, improve the technology of uh, organic solvent recycling rather than uh, uh, concentrate our uh, effort to the uh, Perovskite dye preparation, and also, uh, if you still remember, we talked about the gold layer and the uh, um, manufacturing energy uh, when we analyzed the LCA result. There are also a major uh, contribution. There are also major contributions to our uh, final LCA result. So, technology development of solvent production of recycling definitely can reduce the environmental profile like what we talked before. And also because manufacturing energy uh, make great contribution to the LCA result, we think the renewable energy may uh, make a difference uh, for the uh, final environmental impacts. Okay. Uh, so this is the references I used for this uh, presentation. And at last, I would thank to the travel award from the NSIF, and also I would like to thank uh, my professor, Dr. Chris Yuan, and my uh, university, uh, Wisconsin of Mil uh, Milwaukee. Thank you so much. Yes, it's in the usage phase. So I assume there is a uh, one over 300 uh, probability uh, the solar cell will be broken down uh, in the usage phase. Yeah, is according to uh, literature. Yeah. I think so. We already did the. Uh, um, I think so. We already did uh, uh, two different alternatives, rather, uh, other than gold. One is silver, and the other is aluminum, uh, for the back layer of provascite solar cell. And uh, for, from the LCA result, it turns out uh, silver and aluminum uh, has have better environmental impacts than the gold layer. Um, I think it's because uh, they didn't emit uh, that much uh, toxic metal emissions to the atmosphere as the gold did. Uh, sorry, maybe I didn't explain it uh, clearly. I included the end of life in my solid state provascite, but I didn't include my uh, the end of life in liquid state. So uh, we consider the end of life in solid state uh, with usage phase disassembly and. Uh, just. <laughs> Okay, it's here. So you can see the solid state boundary is from green to gray. So it includes the usage phase, disassembly, and disposal. Uh, I forgot to say, actually, we considered two different scenarios for the disposal phase. We have landfill and uh, incineration with energy recovery. And we also found the uh, scenario of the in, uh, incineration has better environmental performance than the landfill because it has some energy recovery. Uh, from the system, yeah. Okay, 
Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so today's talk is going to be about um, how do we improve the, the climate benefits of photovoltaics uh, through improved manufacturing pra practices uh, in the PV industry. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Sustainable Engineering at Arizona State University. And uh, my, I also like to thank my co-authors, Ben Wender, Tom Seeger, Matt Fraser, and Meng Tao. Um, and so let's start off with what's happening currently in the last 10 to 15 years um, in the PV industry here. You can look at the deployments worldwide. You can see this drastic increase. Um, all of them are in gigawatt, peak gigawatts. So over the, next, over the last six years, it's been really big, and it's reached around 200 gigawatts now, and it's going to increase in the near future. So this trend is here to stay. Um, photovoltaics are being popularly, uh, are popular in terms of governmental policies. Um, so why is this happening? If you look at this graph here, some of the, I picked some of the common locations where they installed the PV systems. Um, California, Germany, Europe, China, India, Australia. Um, the reason for this is uh, wherever you deploy a PV system, you're actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of climate policy, this really helps climate policy by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So the motivation for a PV system ultimately is climate policy. You, it has climate benefits. Um, so that's one part. That's just the benefit. Once we deploy or install the PV system, we get that benefit, environmental or climate benefit. Let's look at the other half, where actually it's getting manufactured. So this is a graph that shows uh, over the last 15 years, 15 to 20 years, where the PV systems are getting manufactured. You can see over there the, the orange over here. That share of that country is really increasing over the last five, six years tremendously. That country happens to be China. So why is it that manufacturing PV in China, what, why is it it's important from a climate perspective? So if you look at it, this, this graph here explains why that is important if you look at it from an environmental perspective. The important axis that we need to look at is the y-axis. The y-axis is the electricity intensity of a country. So China is right up there. It's pretty high in terms of the greenhouse gas intensity. So anything that gets manufactured in China is expensive in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So even a PV system that gets manufactured in China, there's going to be a lot of upfront um, emissions in terms of greenhouse gases. So that's a climate cost. So not only do we have a climate benefit, we also have a climate cost of manufacturing a PV system. So fundamentally, we can boil it down to this equation. Uh, it's simple, so I just put it in this, this form. So the net climate impact of a PV system is nothing but the difference of the environmental benefit that we see once it is um, deployed or installed that happens in a place like California, for example, where you avoid greenhouse gases. And the cost is nothing but what we do up front while we manufacture. It happens in China, we manufacture a PV system, so we have a climate cost over there. So now that we have this equation in place, let's look at how the research, the industry has responded in terms of increasing the climate benefit of a PV system. The dominant approach is let's increase the manufacturing efficiency because if we increase, uh, sorry, let's improve the module efficiency. Increase the module efficiency, we can produce a greater amount of electricity that's green because it's PV electricity from sunlight. So what happens with this is we are increasing climate benefits by increasing the module efficiency. This famous Enril graph is a tribute to this approach that's used by industry and research. We can see efficiencies from across different PV technologies improving rapidly. No doubt this has yielded a large amount of economic and environmental benefits by making PV systems more environmentally friendly and attractive for investments across multiple markets. So this part is pretty much established. My question was, this 
effort of improving module efficiency just focuses on this term. By increasing this, you're increasing the environmental benefit. I, in, in this research, what we explored was, let's look at this term. How do we reduce the environmental cost of a PV system? Because to increase this net climate benefit, we can either increase this term or decrease this term. Both of them give us an increase in the net climate benefit. So the questions that we explored in this research is, what about the manufacturing efficiency? Can we make it less materially and energetically intensive, less intensive? And therefore, what are the climate benefits of that? So what, what we realized was that by improving the manufacturing efficiency in a place like China, we're actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's because you're using less materials and less energy to make the same amount of a PV system or a PV module. So in effect, there is an equivalence between in improving the manufacturing efficiency and improving the module efficiency because both of them reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but at different stages of the PV life cycle. So there is this equivalence, and I'll be using this concept of equivalence right through my presentation. So just keep this in mind. Um, so based on this equivalence, I'll be explore, exploring four questions. What were the historical PV improvements in terms of manufacturing? That's the first question. The second one is, what, what's the current state of PV manufacturing and what are the climate hotspots in the current PV manufacturing practices? The third one is, in case we address these PV manufacturing hotspots, what will be the short-term benefits, short-term climate benefits, and what will be the long-term climate benefits? So it's basically the history, the current practices, and what we can do in the future in terms of environmental and climate improvements. Um, so before I get into these questions, since I'm talking about climate, I'd like to spend a minute on what metric we use to measure climate benefits of improving PV manufacturing. These are some of the current metrics that are used in PV environmental research. We have the GHG intensity, the greenhouse gas intensity of PV electricity. Uh, as you can see, it's much, much lower than the other fossil fuel systems, like coal and um, natural gas. Uh, the other one is your energy payback time. That's the amount of energy, amount of time you take to recover the energy you have invested in a PV system. And there are other uh, metrics which are pretty obvious. What's the manufacturing energy per meter square of a PV module? And what's the, the greenhouse gas breakup of each of the PV components? So all of these are good metrics. They are simple. They are intuitive. But there's a problem with it. They don't account for time sensitivity. Um, this is because... Um, Greenhouse gas emissions tend to stay in the atmosphere. That aspect of time sensitivity is not accounted for the pre by the previous metrics. So I'll be using this metric called radiative forcing uh, to account for this time sensitivity and then calculate the climate impacts of improved PV manufacturing. Uh, so what is radiative forcing? Radiative forcing is nothing but the imbalance in energy that is caused in the atmosphere because of a greenhouse gas emission. So once we emit something like carbon dioxide, it tends to go into the atmosphere and then decay in the atmosphere. As it decays, it absorbs radiation from the sun, and that's why we have this temperature change and global warming. So m all my calculations will use radiative forcing, and this accounts for the time sensitivity of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is important because manufacturing emissions occur earlier in time before the emissions that are avoided later in the use phase. So there is a time lag between when manufacturing happens and when the benefits take place. So this metric is useful and is more accurate in capturing this time lag. So that's why I'll, I'll keep this metric while quantifying my benefits. So the historical trends. Uh, we actually looked at 214 data points from 78 studies uh, which depicted the manufacturing energy requirements per peak watt over the PV system, um, and we harmonized the data because the assumptions were different across different studies. Some of them were not clear, so we had to eliminate some studies. So this was, these were the trends that we got over the four PV technology systems, which were dominant in the past or are, are currently dominant. As you can see here, the black and the blue lines are for the crystalline silicon technologies, and the green and the orange are for the thin film, a cat tail and amorphous silicon technologies. Most of the market, 90% of the market is basically these two technologies, the crystalline silicon technologies. The reason that they showed this tremendous decrease in energy, that is improved manufacturing, is the industry in, in the mid-2000s 
they shifted from electronic grade silicon to solar grade silicon that's because there was a shortage in electronic grade silicon which was extremely pure therefore it's more energy intensive they shifted to solar grade silicon which in comparison is less pure but it's effective and it's less energy intensive so that was one thing that reduced uh, the energy requirements for manufacturing a PV system the second aspect was the absorber layer and the crystalline silicon reduced uh, so that reduced the amount of silicon that's required to manufacture the PV system. So these were the two improvements that led to reduction in energy requirements. So that was the past. So what we did in the next analysis was we looked at all the manufacturing steps that happen in manufacturing crystalline PV uh, silicon and we did a hotspot analysis using the radiative forcing metric and the widest bars are what have the most climate impacts the wider the bar, the greater is the climate impact of that particular manufacturing step or process. So the most uh, climate in intensive aspect of PV manufacturing now is the what kind of electricity are you using in China. That really makes a big difference. So currently we are using coal, coal-based electricity in most of China to manufacture PV systems. So if you can use an alternate source of energy like wind energy or solar energy to manufacture a PV system that will be beneficial. The second most impactful st uh, step uh, process is the process that's used to purify silicon from quartz or sand to uh, solar grade silicon. So it's got multiple steps but we use something called um, the Siemens process followed by the Chokralski process if it's a monosilicon system that's extremely energy intensive it's around 150 kilowatt hours per kg of solar grade silicon. So there are a lot of emissions that happen and that impacts the climate. And the third one is the amount of silicon, solar gas silicon you use in a cell. So I'll be focusing on these three. So these are the climate hotspots. Um, so what we did next was, what are the improvements we can see if we actually address these hotspots? So what we did was um, we simulated scenarios uh, to address these hotspots. Before I present the results, I'd like to get back to that equivalence concept because module efficiency increase is equal to manufacturing efficiency increase. Both of them reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the benefits from this manufacturing improvement that address these hotspots, I've actually quantified it in terms of module efficiency improvements just to show that we can achieve module efficiency improvements through manufacturing improvements if you're going to look at the whole life cycle because both of them give climate benefits both the approaches. So I'll be quantifying them in terms of uh, module efficiency improvements. So these were the scenarios that address the climate hotspots that I showed you in the previous uh, tornado graph. Um, so the first one is if you use PV electricity to manufacture the PV system, uh, system itself, what that means is that we can, on a life cycle basis, we can increase uh, the module efficiency from 16% to around 18% if you use the radiative forcing metric, the climate benefits. This is important. 16 is the current commercial uh, module efficiency. And you can get a 2%, almost a 2% increase in efficiency on a life cycle basis. It might seem small, but actually it is significant because historically, if you look, when the industry has expanded tremendously over the last 10 years or 15 years, the average increase in module efficiency is just 0.25% if you do the calculations. So if you can actually get 2% increase on a life cycle basis, it is significant. You're actually leapfrogging eight years into the future on a life cycle basis. So these approaches actually give you significant efficiency improvements, but on a life cycle basis. Uh, so environmentally, it's very beneficial if you increase manufacturing efficiencies by reducing energy and material requirements. These are the long-term benefits. We calculated this over 25 years. So next we looked at the short-term benefits. Now, why are short-term benefits important? Previous research has clearly showed that you continuously deploy PV systems rapidly. You don't give enough time for you to recover what's been done in China because the pace at which you're deploying is really rapid. So temporary, we, we have a temporary negative climate impact because we are deploying them at a rapid pace. So if you can actually reduce that short-term climate impact, it is beneficial from a global climate perspective. So in order to map the short-term climate benefits, we use this um, equivalence plot. So what we do here is we have this x-axis which repre represents module efficiency, and we have this y-axis that represents 
the energy intensity of manufacturing solar grade silicon and we have this payback time so any point on this payback on the, on this line over here is represents a crf payback time of 4 years so a combination of module efficiency and solar uh, energy intensity in terms of manufacturing silicon will give you this payback time so it's basically uh, on this point in, uh, on this line any point is going to have a payback time of 4 years radiative forcing payback time um, next we calculate for a reduction in crf payback time because we want to reduce the payback time from 4 years to 3.7 years that's our goal because lower the payback time we we get at climate benefits quickly so what you can do here is we can actually move from point p to q by increasing module efficiency only to reduce the payback time from 4 to 3.7 years or we can actually reduce the energy intensity of silicon that's used to manufacture the pv system from p to q dash both these approaches actually reduce the payback time from 4 to 3.7 years the radiative forcing payback time so it's actually equivalent in terms of the short term payback time impacts so what what we found out was if you're going to reduce the energy intensity of silicon uh, by 15 to 17 kilowatt hours per kg if you're able to achieve this decrease in polysilicon manufacturing it's equivalent to increasing the module efficiency from 16 to 17 percent if you consider the short term impacts and similarly we did the analysis for the amount of silicon that's required not this energy intensity but the amount of silicon that's required using the crf payback time analysis and the results show that if you reduce the amount of silicon by 65 grams to 120 grams per meter square of a pv module it's equivalent to increasing the efficiency from 16 to 17 percent so what this clearly says is that uh, module efficiency improvements are important as a strategy but you can also pursue manufacturing improvements to complement module efficiency improvements especially when we reach a terawatt scale it has significant climate benefits considering that most of the pv modules are manufactured in china which is ghg intensive nowadays um, with that i'd like to thank couple of organizations i'd like to thank quest quest is a solar engineering research center at arizona state university that's supporting my research i'd also like to thank for solar for partnering my research and my colleagues at the oz studio at arizona state university um with that i'd like to close and for quest motion boundary that we assumed was it's just the module because if you look at manufacturing of the modules that's what we focused on in this study and so it's just the module yes yes i i understand that and that will come into play if you expand the boundary but the focus was just the module and to actually guide the manufacturers here so the focus was on improving the manufacturing aspects what happens in china that's the module so this focus was i mean the boundary was limited to the module of the, of the pv system yes it's beyond but it studies have already showed that the module is a significant aspect to no doubt the inverter and the balance of systems are important but the module contributes around 40 to 50% of the manufacturing energy requirements of the pv system on a meter square basis so we are addressing that significant chunk um yeah, that's a good question but if you look at the historical trends that's not happened fast i mean we have multiple technology if you look at that uh, if you look at the nrel graph that i showed you there were multiple uh, 
isn't it? Okay. So if I showed you this, yeah, but it's still just three technologies that dominate the market. So it can happen, but historically it's not been that favorable. In fact, these technologies have stabilized now, and the rates are low because of economic uh, learning learning curve effects. Yes, yes, yes. 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 In fact, that. Yes. So, it, this sensitivity analysis is based on both what we incur upfront while manufacturing and also what is displaced. And, and this one is for California. The, the installation location is California and manufacturing in China. We have a paper which also covers Wyoming to, to, to look at the other extreme because Wyoming is coal intensive. Yes. So we have accounted for um, CO2 and CH4, which are like 95% of the radiative forcing impacts in this research. have the keys. So actually one of the scenarios looked at a 100 mu thickness. So that itself gives you like almost a half a percent increase in terms of module efficiency. If you reduce it from 180, that's now prevalent, 180 to 100. So that's for 100. So if you're going to like thin film, 5 microns and 10 microns, it's, it's more, yeah, much, much greater the benefits are.
we had a cancellation, and Anik's been very patient with our last-minute uh, rearrangement of things. Um, so I offered uh, a talk that would substitute for one that was originally in our program. I'm going to take you through work that Dwarak and Ben have contributed to, but it's principally uh, Valentina Prado's approach. She's now at CML uh, in Leiden University in the Netherlands, and she's taking a decision analytic approach to comparing solar technologies. Um, why is that important? Because we're interested in innovation. We have a new school at ASU called the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. We have the Quest Center that Dwarak mentioned. What we want to do is steer innovation towards the environmentally preferable outcomes. The time to do that is long before the commercial scale. So we've got our model of innovation up at the upper left-hand corner when things are working in the fundamental science and the bench scale in the lab. We have a huge design space, lots of variables and decisions to make. But down at the lower right hand, we're in a optimization scenario where our design space is constrained to the basic technological platform that we've chosen, and it requires a great deal more disruption to make an environmental improvement that is beyond the usual uh, sort of eco-efficiency changes. Uh, improving the valves, uh, improving the yields a little bit. So up here at the bench scale, that's where we want to work. There are primarily two tools for environmental assessment and decision making. Uh, one of them is life cycle assessment, the other is risk assessment. Neither of them work very well at the scale at which we want to operate in the upper left uh, at the bench. So uh, we looked at how do life cycle assessment and risk assessment relate to one another, and we created this sort of knowledge flow chart on the right hand side. Uh, it's the characterization factor in LCA. Once you have a source term somewhere along your life cycle, it releases a material into the environment. The question is, how does it relate to environmental risk? The way LCA operates is you multiply the, the magnitude of the release by the characterization factor. The characterization factor uh, incorporates the fate and transport, uh, the exposure, the dose response. So if we're into LCA, we all know this. Um, risk assessment and life cycle assessment, these two different perspectives, they do slightly different things. Although they're attached by the characterization factor principally risk assessment uh, is motivated by compliance, occupational safety, and environmental safety concerns. Life cycle assessment, though, is where we're looking at this responsible innovation, this uh, how would we steer uh, the innovation in a more systemic or in a broader boundary way. So we want to examine life cycle assessment in relation to new technologies. In particular, we're examining nanotechnologies, and we find that both risk and life cycle assessment are good tools for generating a lot of information, not good tools for interpreting that information. So I want to talk more about how to interpret it. This is, I uh, showed this once earlier today, or yesterday, this is our anticipatory LCA knowledge map. And the intention is to move beyond just life and risk uh, assessment to uh, do what we have down in the lower right-hand corner, the multi-criteria decision an analysis, the interpretation, which requires information from the left on uh, stakeholder values, social systems. To do it in an in innovation environment requires information from the top on what are the technologies how are they evolving? Dwarak showed you some of the experience curves. So we made this map to broaden uh, the perspectives of risk and life cycle, incorporate additional information where we can, synthesize it in this multi-criteria analytic framework, and then feed it back to the technology developers, the policy makers, and the environmental scientists, uh, as well as the stakeholders. I'm going to show you uh, how the team is distributed along the map so uh, you get a sense that even though I'm focusing on the decision analytic processes, it's in this uh, bigger context. Terrific. This is what data looks like when we do a life cycle assessment on just about anything. So this is the interpretation problem. The data itself has no meaning. We reduce the data to the types of midpoints that you're probably familiar with. We left the impact categories in the leftmost uh, row. We have uh, an assessment of uh, how, for example, amorphous silicon, CAD tell, multi-silicon, uh, how the different solar technologies relate to these different impact categories. And still, the interpretation, uh, the adding meaning to the data is problematic. Typically, software programs will give us something that looks like this. 
Uh, all of our impact categories are listed along the bottom. The technologies are color coded. These are the same technologies saw, uh, that you saw on the table before. It performs an internal normalization that divides the performance of each technology relative to the worst performing one in that category. And this is an attempt to, to interpret so that people can get an intuitive sense of which the preferable technologies are. Uh, the software developers that give us this kind of graph say, well, it's an unweighted, unbiased representation. I disagree. It's an equally weighted and horribly biased representation. So although it's easily accessible, you hit a button and you get results like this, it's the guidance that it provides can be in completely the wrong direction. We want to improve upon the software tools that are available right now for people working on what we're working on. Uh, environmentally responsible innovation, especially in the PV space. This is an alternative. Uh, ex internal normalization is when you uh, divide the performance of each technology by the worst performing one in that category. This is an external normalization. And in external normalization, you don't worry about the alternatives uh, that you've selected. You divide their performance by uh, the performance of an entire geographic region, an entire country, an entire industry. And the interesting thing that happens is you can get your technology's contribution to a broader social problem. So here we can uh, see ozone depletion and the PV technologies that we've assessed are not major contributors to the larger stratospheric ozone depletion problem. This is helpful for identifying hot spots within a technology to say, oh, we really have to work on those water emissions. Look, marine toxic ecotoxicity and freshwater eutrophication, uh, our industry makes large contributions relative to uh, other impact categories to these impact categories. Let's uh, focus on water as an uh, area of improvement. But it does little to show the uh, differences between the technologies. When we use external normalization, we can find that all the technologies are clumped together and they highlight that water is a problem, but it doesn't show us much about which of the technologies are preferable from a water standpoint. So we're choosing a different approach. Instead of trying to understand the impact of the technology, which is the traditional way that risk assessment and life cycle assessment work, we want to understand the impact of the decision. Given the decisions available to you, uh, which photovoltaic technology do I want to employ? What are the trade-offs associated with the decision? To do that, we take the performance of each alternative on a criterion so this would be a single criterion, and we've made up units of characterized impact. And we recognize that those performance are not best represented by point estimates, but by probability density functions. We list these probability density functions, and this is a difficult uh, one here, because we have one technology with a narrow uncertainty band, and one technology with a broad uncertainty band. And the impact of the decision is different than the impact of the technology. The impact of the decision depends upon the difference between the two, not the absolute uh, measure. So how would we characterize the, uh, the trade-off rather than the environmental impact? Well, what we do is, uh, what I've showed you over on the left, is called outranking. We compare the performance of two or more technologies on one criterion, and we say which is preferable. If we can express a complete preference, we, then we compare uh, this performance. We say we know that uh, cad -tel is preferable to uh, monocrystalline silicon relative to this one criterion. A complete preference gives us a score of 1. Indifference, as we might get from this graph, gives us a score of 0. Now think about this. When I'm in the Northeast, uh, a hockey analogy really works. We want to know which is the best hockey team. So the hockey teams play games, and these games are like pairwise comparisons. If you win, you get a point. I guess it's two points in hockey. If you tie, you get one, and if you lose, you get no points. So the sports metaphor works here. It doesn't matter by how many goals you win. You only get the credit for a win. And here, it doesn't matter by how far the technology outperforms. In the pairwise comparison, once a preference is complete, there is no extra credit for overperformance. This helps solve a problem of environmental compensation, in which overperformance on ozone does not compensate for worse performance on marine ecotoxicity. We use pairwise comparison to normalize. This is an internal normalization, but it's a different internal normalization than one that I showed you before. 
And then we have to apply the weights. These are the two most problematic elements of the interpretation phase of a life cycle assessment, normalization and weighting. And the big controversy is where should the weights come from? How do we elicit the weights from stakeholders? Often stakeholders don't even know what their own weights are. But if there's going to be trade-offs made, then any decision, at least implicitly, it demands that you weight those trade-offs. We use linear weights, and because we don't know how to model them or elicit them, we model them stochastically. Over on the right-hand side, I've shown you the beta distributions that represent all of the mathematically feasible solutions to a weighting problem. We sample that using Monte Carlo, so we explore all the feasible weight spaces, and uh, we get results that incorporate all of this uncertainty. Now, in our software program, we allow people to manipulate those weights. We allow them to constrain the weight spaces because they might ha be able to express some value, even if they're not able to reduce it to a single point estimate. They'd say, I don't know what global warming is, but it's not 90% of the decision, and it's got to be more than 10. So they are able to manipulate the sliders to constrain the weight spaces, and within those constraints, we explore it stochastically. Uh, we've automated this in a software program to try to make it just as easy for people who want to interpret their data this way as it is for people to interpret it in the existing ways. I'm going to skip forward uh, to what the results look like. When we incorporate the inventory uncertainty, the weight uncertainty, and we use pairwise comparison uh, to compare the alternatives on each criteria, we get results that look like this. The environmentally preferable alternatives are to the right, and the environmentally inferior alternatives are to the left. Now, this ties back to what Dwarak uh, has showed us. There's been a great deal of attention and resources paid to improving the efficiency and the quality of the cells in the use phase. But without the same attention being paid to the manufacturing phase, on a life cycle basis, we might wind up with environmentally suboptimal technologies. The ones on the right, amorphous silicon and cad -tel, we now have confidence that they're preferable to this monocrystalline uh, silicon on the left. There's some area of overlap in the middle. That is to say, depending upon the weights, depending upon the specific inventory conditions, certainly single uh, crystalline silicon could be preferable to cad -tel. But because cad -tel is less uh, environmentally intensive in the manufacturing phase, we're fairly certain that it's environmentally preferable. And then there are other technologies in the middle. What does that mean? It means that research effort might be better applied, as Dwork was suggesting, to improving the environmental profile of manufacturing rather than the efficiency of the ultimate cell. Now, I uh, skipped uh, some setup here. This is the software that we use for impact assessment. Uh, this is just revisiting the um, technologies that we're looking at. We used some uh, commercial scale efficiencies to model them, and I want to highlight now what we learned from this about improving the manufacturing stage. So I'm going backwards on this slide. Our scientific curiosity might lead us to those uncertainties that look largest. We say, oh my gosh, we don't have any handle on water depletion. When we used the external normalization, we knew that water was an important impact criterion. And the external normalization says, focus your research effort there. Look into manufacturing and improve your water. But even if uncertainty is high, confidence in the decision might still be high. That is, uncertainty and impact does not necessarily translate to uncertainty in the decision. Freshwater eutrophication down at the bottom, and these are real results, shows lots of overlap in our estimated performance, whereas water depletion does not. We have confidence that cad -tel is superior to water depletion, and more research that narrows the uncertainty or, or uh, uh, narrows the probability density function, will not improve our confidence in the decision. Whereas more research in freshwater eutrophication that changes those probability density functions just might. This is a different way of prioritizing uncertainties in the life cycle for further investigation, as well as uh, the attention that we pay to where in the life cycle needs improvement. This also might be a basis for choosing uh, one technology over another if the uh, if what's important to you is getting the environmentally uh, preferable outcome. But as you can see, it's not definitive. The, we've done uh, the best we can to model both the uncertainty on the social side in the weights and in the technical side in the inventories and the characterization factor to give the decision maker confidence uh, or a lack thereof rather than a single answer. That concludes my remarks. Mm -hmm.
Sand. I have not presented this to my friends at Team of Team Science. Why do you ask? They might be. This is our team. Yeah, I think you're on the right track with that. We have electrical engineering, we have physics, we have civil and environmental engineering, and we have design represented on the team. So the problems of knowledge integration are non-trivial. If they had a journal, I'd publish in it, yeah. But y you, you raise a great point, and those are my friends, and we talk to them all the time. Or praise. Other other questions, comments. Anik. We can do much better than that. Like what's actually installed is not the leading edge. And so uh, one thing that Dwarak's been better at than Valentina is when we start changing some of the parameters. How do the curves change? Uh, and we can't do that in real time, but we can kind of rerun the analysis to explore future scenarios in a more manual way, and I think it's a great idea. Um, what I didn't show is what are the thermodynamic limits that should constrain our imagination? Uh, and there are thermo thermodynamic limits to performance on the use phase. Uh, you know, when are we going to go to um, multi-junction cells, uh, for example, to try and push the upper limit. Uh, there are thermodynamic limits on the manufacturing phase. There's only so much atomic efficiency that we could possibly get. And so the, the sense that I'm getting, I'm actually I'm really excited about what Ryan was saying about 1366, is that we're reaching the asymptote on the manufacturing phase for monocrystalline silicon with the paradigm that we've been using now, building out a single crystal and cutting it up as thin as we possibly can. We're, uh, growing it up from scratch, even if it's uh, polysilicon, um, sounds like the quantum step forward on bringing the energy costs in the manufacturing down. There might be a hit on efficiency. This analysis suggests that if you're in a utility scale in the desert where land is not an issue, take the hit on efficiency. If you're building integrated in an urban environment, uh, maybe you really need the efficiency because you want to maximize what you can get out of your roof area. There's room for more than one technology, and the uncertainty that we have shows that the answer as to what's environmentally preferable is context-dependent, but some themes are emerging from the data. Ryan? Oops. It's a good point uh, because you need to get more electron. Your balance system is kind of a fixed cost. So you're going to amortize that over so much power that you're producing in one time or so much energy over an integral of time. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I have Chris Hansberg and I have Ricky to remind me of dollars per hour. We didn't, you're right, it's not up here. We didn't care. We're like, what's the environmental perspective tell us? But clearly, uh, th there's no population of people out there who don't care about the cost. The cost is another criterion. And we can build it into the multi-criteria decision analytics. Like say, here's the environmental criteria, but all that has to be weighed against economic cost. Yeah.
it would be uh, an even larger uncertainty. The, uh, when you monetize environment, you're working in this area of intangible costs. Um, what's the morbidity and mortality of PM 2.5 uh, inhalation, for example? And so we've looked at that. And people say, yeah, okay, let's just put a value on a life. Somewhere between fifty-five and three hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars sounds uh, reasonable. The uncertainty explodes, and but the problem reduces from multi-criteria to mono-criteria. Uh, you know, we're looking for one, a way to normalize using by translating everything to economic costs, and then we're going to uh, select the economically preferable outcome. I'm not like philosophically against it, but every time we aggregate to simplify the decision, we lose information that we aggregated along the way. Other thoughts? Because I'm okay ending early, too. You know? Well, thanks very much.